there folks, welcome into today's video. Couple of videos to react to and uh, there's a video here today. So first one is this one which gets into a little bit of Nvidia stock, AMD stock, Meta stock as well. I also wanna show you some metrics around Nvidia and AMD if we're trying to compare those companies that I think are important there. And the second video we're gonna react to is this one here. We expect a significant recession, okay? So I wanna watch that one, react to that one, give you guys my take on this all as always. I appreciate everybody joining me, over 10,000 subscribers at this point. Thank you so much for everybody that's here and uh, enjoying the videos, and I appreciate all you guys. All righty, let's get into this. Joining us, you invested in so many amazing companies, including Meta and your days at Excel. Now you are running your own firm, Briar Capital, um, and you have some interesting takes on the private market as well as the public market, but let's start with the public stocks. You have some big bets in the mega cap tech companies. Tell us which ones and why. You bet. Uh, and it's great to be back here. And congratulations to Kara on 20 years. Um, I'll just run through the theory. The theory is buy the best houses in the best neighborhoods where there's a key man that has five to 10 years left who can really impact the business. Key man means uh, the person actually running the company. So notable investments include obviously Meta, Etsy, uh, Spotify, and more here. So I and that's an interesting perspective because basically what he's talking about is basically by the best of quality. So buy into a growing space, like a growing industry, growing sector, right? That has a lot of growth. Um, a company that has a CEO that's, um, you know, good and has at least five to 10 years ahead of themselves. They're not like going to retire tomorrow or something like that. And um, is the best of breed of that industry or sector is essentially what he's saying, focus on it. At least that's his investment strategy, which I think is uh, pretty compelling. With NVIDIA. I think NVIDIA, after this correction, is a deeply compelling three-year bet. More as well. So all of these are in the context of three years. They are so far ahead of everyone else in building mm -hmm. the semiconductor infrastructure for AI and quantum. Uh, they are so far ahead of anyone in China or in Europe. And so the two chip stocks I really like and continue to add to the position are AMD and NVIDIA. AMD for many of the same reasons. Lisa is a superb CEO. And what can one say about Jensen? A plus. And you're also, I understand, in Microsoft and Apple, also because you... So we'll, we'll jump back into that in just a second here. I want to just kind of compare these companies, kind of where they're trading at. Forward P basis, um, NVIDIA is trading at about a 40 right now versus AMD, which is trading at about a 16. So, you know, obviously there's a lot of different things you got to look at with these companies, the management teams. You obviously got to look at like who's got the bigger growth vector in front of themselves over the next five, 10 years, who's got the superior technology, who's going to, you know, likely grow more, not just revenues, but the bottom line. So there's a lot that goes into that. But obviously if we're just comparing this on a Ford P basis, um, obviously AMD looks like a you know, a better buy than NVIDIA right now by quite a bit, right? But there's once again, a lot more that goes into it. If we were to compare these stocks as far as the, the performance, the stock price, NVIDIA has been hurt a lot more this year, down 53, almost 54%. AMD's down about 45%. So we're talking about 10 percentage points, roughly, um, almost 10 percentage points that NVIDIA is down more than um, AMD, essentially. So that's interesting. As far as the uh, price to sales ratio is 11.7 for NVIDIA here. AMD's trading at a six price to sales. So this is where, you know, if we're just looking at the raw numbers, it looks like AMD's a better buy. But once again, there's a lot more that goes into stock picking than just looking at a raw number, right? And then if we were to look at P ratio, NVIDIA's trading at a 45, AMD's trading at a 34. Once again, much more compelling for AMD. Uh, priced a book of 2.4 on AMD versus 13.3 for NVIDIA. So basically every single metric you possibly want to look at, you're gonna find that AMD looks like the more compelling buy right now than Nvidia if we're just going upon the numbers. But once again, in the stock market, I wish it was as easy as it's just you look at a few metrics and it's like, well, this stock's a better buy than this stock. It doesn't work like that. There's a lot more that goes into that. Maybe Nvidia is gonna massively outgrow AMD over the next five, 10 years, right? And if that's the case, then they deserve to trade at a premium to AMD and maybe they should trade at even a bigger uh, you know, a premium. But that's, um, that's where you really start to get into the nitty gritty of these business models 
models and kind of what they have going on. If you have a strong opinion on if you think AMD is a better buy right now or Nvidia, I would love to hear from you guys as always. Clearly, once again, if we're just judging off the numbers, it's AMD without even a, a question believe in those leaders, but I have to get your take on Meta. You were on the board of then Facebook, now Meta for many years. I understand you're still in the stock, but what's your take on Zuckerberg transitioning this company to be all about the metaverse? Uh, I think the core business at Meta is strong, although it has headwinds as Google and others do in the advertising space. I would love to see Mark lay out far more specifically what his metaverse strategy is. At the high level, I understand where he's going, knowing Mark extremely well. Uh, gaming is a very important part of the metaverse. Uh, they are building platforms that allow really interesting gaming applications on Oculus, and next year will be the big year with Apple, Sony, and others introducing glasses. But it's not a coherent strategy yet, that gives me pause. I think Mark will get there. Uh, the other thing I would say about Facebook that is not appreciated enough, Instagram and WhatsApp mm -hmm. are two of the most important applications worldwide. And recently we've seen some interaction on WhatsApp in yeah. India with shopping uh, and partnerships. WhatsApp and Instagram and where they're going are two of the truly worldwide horizontal applications that make a big difference. And I have to ask about TikTok, though, of because course. you're an investor. Yeah, so great point there. In, in terms of meta, yeah, I think, I think definitely Zuckerberg can do a better job over the next year of kind of explaining, you know, where their opportunity is, like how big this opportunity is, and explaining exactly how Meta is going to potentially attack this. I think Meta also, you know, here's the interesting thing, okay? I understand a lot of, like, Wall Street and investors in general want to, like, all get into, like, the nitty-gritty details to understand this, okay? A couple things. One is people still aren't going to understand it. It doesn't matter how many times you explain it, they're still not going to get this thing. There's a lot of people that are going in with such denial into this, you know, I listen to these people all the time, like, oh, metaverse is like not going to happen, or there's so many years out and things like that. They're so in, um, they're so not open to even the idea of hearing about it that how are you going to convince somebody like that that is so not even open to that idea, right? It, it's difficult. It's like you ever had to deal with somebody that's super into one political party or something like that and try to talk to them about the other political party. It's not happening. And so those sorts of people are going to be very hard to convince. Also, does Zuckerberg want to necessarily give away the whole roadmap on everything they're up to? I think they're clearly in the lead in this industry and where you know things are going to go over the next five, ten years. Does he really want to give Apple the blueprint and Google the blueprint and, and these other companies that, in my opinion, are all lagging significantly behind Meta in this situation? I don't think so because he's going to. He knows that if he's to give out you know the play by play. Apple's smart enough. They will understand everything that's going on there. And Apple's had an incredible time innovating in any, in any substantial way for that company since Jobs uh, passed away 12 years ago or 11 years ago, right? You know, a Apple's still running off the fumes of stuff, the entire business model that Steve Jobs set up with the App Store, with the app ecosystem, with the iPhone, with the iPad and the Mac business. Th that company's still running off the fumes of what Jobs set up so many years ago, right? So they need any help they can get. And if that means, uh, you know, Meta can give them the play by play and maybe they can try to copy it, that would be good. Google, uh, you know, they haven't done much for a long time. Google search is like ancient history now. And it's just a great, uh, you know, platform that, you know, I use on a daily basis and probably a lot of people watching this video use on a daily basis. Right. But that was set up a whole long time ago. Right. YouTube, they bought YouTube like, uh, what, 15, 16 years ago or whatever it was. That was a long, long time ago as well. So Google's had a trouble innovating for a long time. And by the way, they bought Android as well. So does Meta want to give them kind of the blueprint as well. Right. And Microsoft's not a threat in that space. Amazon is not a threat in that space. It's really, you know, if I look at two companies that are threats in that space, I think it's Apple and Google. And both those companies have an extraordinary amount of time of doing anything game changing because neither one of those companies has done anything game changing for, you know, 15 years, to be quite frank. 15 years. They haven't done anything game changing. They just had their core products and they've just found a way to kind of expand those and make those products a little better. Google search is just a little better. YouTube's just a little better, right? The iPhone just gets a little better. The app store gets a little better, but they haven't done anything that's a game changer. Like what we're talking about with the metaverse. 
in, in a long time. And can they even execute on that, right? And if Zuckerberg gives away too much information, maybe they have a better opportunity for that, right? So there's just kind of something I kind of keep in mind there that I definitely think about. And, um, you know, if there's one big company that can potentially change their entire business model, I think it's the one that's got the actual leader in place that has done game-changing stuff in the past. Apple doesn't have that nowadays, okay? Tim Cook's a great executor at business, but he's not the type of person that's going to come up with the next, uh, you know, 500 or trillion dollar opportunity for Apple. He just hasn't done that. He never has done that. Um, same thing with, you know, uh, no dis- disrespect to the, the, the gentleman that obviously is leading Google. He does a good job, but those just aren't those aren't game changers in terms of the, the person that's going to find the next trillion dollar opportunity. They're just not. They've never done it. They've never proven that. And, uh, you know, to bet on somebody to do that that hasn't done that, <laughs> it's a very difficult proposition. They're, they're business runners at the end of the day. Zuckerberg's the only person that's in power at a big tech now that has built, you know, a $500 billion, a trillion dollar company, right? in those sorts of products. In TikTok, and that is the company that everyone has been talking about here at this conference, both on stage and <laughs> off as a, as a mega threat. Um, some people saying it's a threat to society, others saying it's just a threat to these social platforms. What do you think? It, it certainly is a threat. Uh, now, there are a number of different elements, but what they did is poured very significant money into AI so that the user experience is trained in a way that content that really does become compelling for the user keeps coming up again and again and that user keeps training the algorithms. Uh, So they've taken a different approach than what Snap and Facebook and others, YouTube, have done. And they've also invested really smartly in, again, these underlying AI technologies. Uh, Tremendous threat because Advertisers love them. Uh, there are lots of risks in, ter- in terms of when CFIUS and others examine yeah. where is that data, where does it go, uh, but the, the company is knocking it out of the park. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, they, they still talk about potentially banning you know, the talk at some point. We'll see what happens with that. Um, you know, from the U.S. perspective, it's like, you know, you're allowing a Chinese company to operate in a significant manner inside the United States when China doesn't let us operate any of our social medias like Facebook, you know, YouTube, anything like that, which, by the way, I think there's actually quite a few people in China that actually still watch YouTube, in my personal opinion, based upon all the study and things I've seen over time. But they I don't know, probably use some VPN or something like that um, to be able to watch it over there. But, um, you know, in terms of our big techs, they're almost shut out outside of Apple pretty much. Right. And, um, you know, it, it's kind of a it's a it's a weird situation. It's a very very weird situation. I'll call it that. Um, does anything get banned over there? I don't know. We'll we'll, we'll see. Um, as of right now, it doesn't seem like there's a big push for that. From Christine Lagarde, after she decided there's no recession ahead. Well, I will listen, of course, to three things. First of all, what does she say about the future path of interest rates? Does she go beyond this meeting by meeting approach? Any hint whether the next move <coughs> could be 50, 25 or another big 75? Again, that's the one key right. thing. <clears throat> Second, I love an explanation why they don't yet see a recession. We expect a significant recession in coming months. And third, any comments on the future of their asset purchase programs? More precisely, any comments on A, could there be some quantitative tightening, some roll off of expiring bonds from the ECB's balance sheet in the future? Or what do they think and what do they think about current yield levels? Are they anyway? For any of my Americans that don't know ECB, by the way, it's the European Central Bank. So think of it as uh, the Fed in Europe, okay? <laughs> close to read, uh, needing this TPI new intervention program in favor of Italy. Probably they are not, but any comment on that right. would, of course, be most interesting. Holger Schmieding, what is the power of Otmar Issing, of Axel Weber, of a Bundesbank culture back to World War II, certainly back to the reformation of Europe coming out of World War II. What is the Germanic power at the ECB this morning? Well, to say the hawkish viewpoint on rates did prevail. I wouldn't quite call it Germanic power. It is just that we've seen such a surge in inflation that the European Central Bank, like the U.S. Fed, has decided it needs to be seen as fighting inflation. And we'll hear whether this was a consensus. I suppose this was an 
near unanimous consensus that the ECB at the Council needs to do something significant. And the quid pro quo may have been that the ECB does not, judging by the statement, edge closer towards quantitative tightening. So that's something which the Dublin may have gotten out of it. But we'll see you at the press conference. Any comments about that? Holger, would you call this front-loading? Yeah, the toughest thing for the European Central Bank here is, you know, they can continue to hike rates and hike rates, but the main thing that's hurting Europe, especially right now, and could be even more so in the winter, we'll see how things play out, is energy prices, right? Because obviously, uh, you know, with all the sanctions that were on Russia, and now Russia is talking about, you know, potentially letting uh, Europe freeze a little bit is kind of the threat I'm hearing out there um, from, from Big P over there. And so... It's, it's not an ideal situation. So, you know, Europe can continue to raise interest rates and that could continue to hurt their economy worse and worse and worse and businesses worse and worse and worse, which are already being hurt in a substantial way, right? But I've also heard rumors that potentially, um, you know, some of these European nations could potentially start <laughs> paying people's electric bills, essentially, okay? We'll see what happens with that. Uh, but don't be surprised if that happens. If, if energy prices continue to go sky high into the winter time. You know, we'll see what happens, but I wouldn't be surprised if uh, Europe just ends up starting to pick up the tab as that, which is kind of another form of uh, stimulus. But, you know, it's either that or uh, people might not be able to uh, heat their heat their homes. I mean, to be quite frank, it, it's out of control. Energy prices in general have gone a little wild, but especially uh, in, in regards to Europe and, you know, electricity cost. Oh, my gosh. Look at a chart of that. It's awful what's been going on in Europe. We're just incredibly delighted. Well, this is front-loading relative to ECB standards. They haven't done 75 basis points before. That is quite a bit, especially in a situation where many indicators suggest that the economy is heading not just for stagnation, but probably for worse a recession, which over time will, of course, on its own dampen inflationary pressures. A lot of journalists listening to your response, Holger, and trying to work out the appropriate question to ask the president in this news conference. Just why isn't she forecasting? A recession. Why is the staff of the ECB not forecasting one? That's a good question. I'd love to listen to the answer and I will try. And I'm sure one of your colleagues will pose that question at the news conference. My impression is that A, the ECB is typically a bit slow in revising these forecasts. They have now meeting after... Same exact thing with the Fed. You know, look at Bernanke back uh, prior to the Great Recession. You know, is. The problem is you're looking a lot of times these folks look at unemployment and, um, you know, unemployment is still relatively low, whether you're looking at Europe, whether you're looking at the states. And so, you know, it makes it hard for people to kind of forecast even in these these positions at either the Fed or the European Central Bank. Right. It makes it hard for them to say, oh, yeah, we're going to have a recession when unemployment is still incredibly low. They don't necessarily necessarily see, um, you know, businesses going out of business at that sort of rate and things like that or any big companies. So. They're, they're um, you know, they, they can't make that prediction that, oh, we're going to have a recession or something like that. Forecast round after forecast round being forced to make significant changes. And secondly, they may be a bit under the impression of the very good data for the second quarter above trend growth in the Eurozone and what was in Southern Europe probably a very good tourist season over the summer. But if we still hang in in Q3, despite all the bad news about energy, that actually means that the risk that Q4 from a good, still decent Q3, that Q4 could be deeply negative, that risk is actually rising rather than falling. And I'd love to hear the ECB explain why that should not just be, why that should be stagnation rather than actual recession. That By the way, if you if you uh, got some dough and you've been looking to do a big Europe Europe trip. Uh, you might want to go over the next, uh, let's just call it six to 12 months. And the reason being is essentially uh, the, the dollar is incredibly strong right now. And, uh, you know, the euro is incredibly actually weak right now compared to the dollar. So if there's ever a good time to take one of those uh, big European vacations, it's over the next uh, six to 12 months. Let's just put it that way. Uh, yeah, you, you, your dollar goes a little bit further than a, a lot further than it usually does. The benefit of the doubt version of things. Then you've got the Vasilius Giannakis uh, take on it, which made him somewhat bearish on the euro, all things being equal, saying it highlights how this is an ECB that still is prioritizing growth in tandem with just... See, I mean, you look at the ECB there slashing their, their 2023 GDP. GDP growth 
to 0.9% from 2.1. That's a big slash there. We're talking about less than 1%. I mean, that's flirting with going negative. You know, when you start talking about you're expecting less than 1% growth, you're right there, baby. You are right there with potentially being a, in, a, in a negative place. Inflation, which makes him somewhat concerned. Do you get the same message from the fact that they did not forecast recession, that they're still forecasting growth despite very much higher rates and despite some of the incredible economic pain facing the region? Well, I don't quite get that impression. I would focus more on it's been... Check this economic out. Pain. <laughs> I'm fairly certain that her voice is being picked up from this microphone right here, but they have these nice looking microphones. I honestly think the more I look at it, I think these are just for show and their, their voice is actually just being picked up from these little microphones right here. It's just funny, right? It's, uh, it does look cool though, it looks nice. I just don't think it's actually picking up any audio. Facing the region. Well, I don't quite get that impression. I would focus more on it's been 75 basis points it's been 50 basis points in the meeting before, more than the ECB had indicated beforehand, especially a few months ago. And the ECB has vowed to raise rates further. So I don't think that this decision today exhibits any sort of hesitancy on doing what it takes to tackle inflation. The real question over here is whether anything the ECB can do really will have a significant impact on inflation as the European inflation, a bit unlike the US inflation, the European inflation is largely a matter, well, of Putin's war against Ukraine, of the sky high wholesale prices for gas, for electricity, and not the result of any excess consumer demand over here, or not yet, at least the result of any excess wage pressures. Is there a pivot uh, point threshold that you're looking for? In other words, is there a point of pain in the economy that might be big enough for the ECB to reverse course? Well, the ECB probably won't reverse course, but I think that um, come the beginning of next year, with probably the fourth quarter having been significantly negative, and the outlook likely to be that in the first quarter of next year, the recession will remain pretty deep, that then the ECB will likely go on hold. So the ECB may now raise rates, the main refi rate to say 2% by December with a chance it could be a bit above that. But next year with the economy in a probably quite significant recession early next year and late this year already, next year I think the ECB will then stay on. See, when somebody says, uh, you know, significant recession, I, I, I wish I would get more into the nitty gritty details. What does that mean? You know, you say significant recession, but everybody can have a different thought process on what a significant recession is. Some people think that's, uh, you know, negative GDP of 5%, right? Uh, you know, they think that's unemployment at, uh, you know, 7%, 8%, 9%, something like that. There's somebody else could be significant recession, and it's like they're thinking like 5.5% unemployment rate. They could be thinking about, you know, just slightly down GDP you know, I, I, the specifics are important because significant recession means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And if we asked, you know, a thousand people in the financial markets what a significant recession is, every single one of them will have a different interpretation of what a significant recession is. And let the recession and the base effects of inflation do the job of bringing annual inflation down again quite a lot over the course of next year from probably early spring onwards. Holger, Christine Lagarde will parse today the difference between Brent crude and natural gas. What is Berenberg's research here on the separation of a much better statistic for a barrel of Brent crude versus the agony of what we see in natural gas right now? Well, over here, these various sources of energy are very disconnected in the sense that Brent crude is, of course, one major element of a largely global market for crude oil. And in the global market, we've seen a bit of, well, pr price easing for oil in response to, well, recession, or at least recession fears. Whereas gas prices extremely volatile are up to the calculus, can Europe make it through the winter or not? We are currently modestly optimistic that Europe can make it through the winter without having to ration gas uh, to, in, to industry. But the price for that is we in Europe are filling up our storage facilities quite nicely, but we are paying through the nose for it. So natural gas and to some extent electricity reflect the European drive to basically 
prepare for the winter at almost any cost, whereas oil is a global price, more or less. Yeah, no, that, that's a good point there. And, uh, you know, in, in terms of, uh, you know, natural gas, it's a bubble, man. <laughs> Natural gas is a bubble. That's all I can say about that. That baby's not going to stay up there uh, forever and ever. Let's just call it that. Uh, and uh, the the story will eventually erode for natural gas, um, especially as we get further along into winter time. That's when the story really will start to erode. No different than the oil story start to erode. Right? Everybody was so jacked up about uh, you know big travel summer coming. Everything that obviously happened with the Russia Ukraine supply shock situation there. Right. And, uh, you know, and then it got over with. And now look what oil is doing. Uh, you know, it's down massively since this summer. And uh, you can see a very similar phenomenon happen with natural gas where, you know, it remains elevated for, let's just call it the next few months or something like that. But then as you get further and further into winter and then you, you talk about getting closer and closer to spring, that's, uh, you know, obviously a bad setup for natural gas in, in that whole scenario. So anyways, guys, hope you enjoyed today's video. As always, I appreciate you joining me on the new channel. Much love as always. If you're looking to say hello to me on IG or something like that, check out the pinned comment down there. Say hello to me. Send me a DM. Uh, let me know what stocks you own and what stocks you're buying out there. I always love to hear from you guys as always. Much love and have a great day.